In Ryan Johnson's 2022 film Glass Onion, Detective Benoit Blanc finds himself wrapped up in a mystery involving a brilliant, charismatic tech billionaire and his inner circle of wealthy influencers, all successful in their own varied projects, be that acting, streaming, politics, or fashion. Much to the frustration of conservative simps and great man bootlickers, nearly every wealthy character is revealed to have zero principles, zero substance, and zero wisdom. In the Benoit Blancaverse, the world's rich and powerful are all fools. Fools who are saved by wealth, either inherited from their family or stolen through skullduggery. This concentration of wealth is protected by a pact, just as often unspoken as overt among the 1%, a fierce, unbending class loyalty that celebrates power for its own sake and knows that if any of them are exposed, the entire system they hide within becomes the emperor's new clothes, with all the full frontal that implies. But I don't want to talk about Glass Onion. It's great. Go watch it. Instead, I want to talk about another film from 2022, The Menu directed by Mark Mylod and written by Will Tracy and Seth Reese. The premise of the film is simple. A young, well-to-do foodie named Tyler secures an invite to an exclusive restaurant called Hawthorne, run by world-renowned chef Julian Slowick. The restaurant is located on a secluded island compound and seats only 12 diners at a time for its legendary four-hour multi-course meals. Tyler invites down-to-earth Margot as his date to the dinner, and while she's initially game for a night of fancy food, she begins to lose patience with the self-importance of both the chef and his offerings, and Tyler is clearly far more interested in fawning over Chef Slowick than he is in keeping Margot happy. Unfortunately, she can't storm out. They're on an island. There's nowhere to go. And then it gets weird. Here, I'm going to spoil the entire plot of the menu because what I want to talk about is the climax. I'm someone who personally hates spoilers, so if you're like me, please let the video continue to play while you go watch the menu in another room. That way I get the view count for it. However, I will say that I think this film works very well even if you know the outcome because, in a sense, it is the inevitability of the outcome that I find so powerful, along with the performances of the cast as they get closer and closer to dessert. In films like Titanic, knowing what's coming before the characters do is part of the tragically delicious agony that animates the film, and the menu is... very delicious. So here goes. Duh, the diners have been invited to this dinner in order to be killed. See, Chef Slowick takes his work very seriously. He is an artist, and his canvas isn't just the food on the plate, it is each individual experience of inhaling, craving, tasting, and savoring. He has put his entire life into perfecting his craft, sacrificing his time, his body, and his relationships in order to bring people unforgettable, one-of-a-kind experiences. And one by one, each person invited to dine at Hawthorne on this fateful night has been involved in disrespecting and destroying the love he once had for his art. From the finance bros working for the angel investor who kept him afloat during COVID, to the food critic who elevates her status by driving restaurants to close with scathing reviews, to the ultra-wealthy older couple who dine with him every week and yet can't name a single dish because they are only there to consume, Chef Slow Slowick has watched his art, his passion, his entire reason for being reduced into a commodity to be traded and a status symbol to inspire envy. So on the evening this film takes place, Chef Slowick has prepared his magnum opus, a gustatory experience that cannot be commodified, cannot be taken for granted, and cannot be forgotten. The courses begin as one might expect from any luxury dining experience. High quality ingredients, cheeky presentation, but the third course begins to shift the tenor of the evening. The tortillas have evidence of affairs, embezzlement, and other personal misdeeds seared into them. The reaction from the diners ranges from confusion to indignance, but dinner continues. Then comes the fourth course. Chef Slowick introduces his sous chef, Jeremy. After briefly talking up his accolades, Slowick declares that Jeremy will never be a great chef, which Jeremy acknowledges. And with that, Jeremy takes a gun and shoots himself in the head in the center of the dining room. 
A panic ensues as the diners are not sure whether this is some kind of extreme dinner theater or whether what they witnessed really happened. When one of the guests attempts to leave, the staff restrain him and cut off his finger. The rest of the diners decide this must be a performance and return to their tables, shaken. During the fifth course, male diners are given the option to flee, an option they all take, while their dates remain in the restaurant. Each male guest is recaptured by the restaurant staff without much trouble or resistance. Around this time in the film is when Chef Slowick reveals the truth to the rest of the diners. Because of their behavior, every single person in the building, chef and staff included, will die. The diners protest weakly before falling silent, either accepting their fate or holding out hope that this is some kind of elaborate prank. But something else is revealed as well. Tyler's down-to-earth date Margot is a sex worker named Aaron. Months prior, when Tyler called to set up an invite, he was explicitly told that he and his date would be killed if he attended Hawthorne. But Tyler so idolized Chef Slowick and so desired the status symbol of eating at the restaurant that he decided to leave his girlfriend behind and bring Aaron instead. Tyler, who has been sucking up to Slowick all night, is invited to prepare a dish in Slowick's kitchen to show off the foodie skills he keeps bragging about. The scene ends with him hanging by his belt in case you're wondering how good the dish was. Slowick recognizes Aaron as a fellow provider of experiences, and the two share a brief moment of connection. Slowick offers to let Aaron die with the staff instead of the wealthy, as she doesn't deserve to be lumped together with society's users and abusers. Aaron uses her newfound rapport with Slowick to snoop around his cottage on the island, discovering an article about his humble origins as a fast food cook in a small town. Her snooping pisses off Slowick, who condemns her to die with the guests after all. But then something happens. Aaron tells Slowick that his food is pretentious and loveless and that she's still hungry. Slowick is taken aback, having not been criticized like this in many years. When he asks what she wants to eat, she orders a cheeseburger. As he prepares the highest quality burger you've ever seen in your life, that spark of love begins to return to him. When she asks for the burger to go, he allows her to leave. For everyone else, it's time for dessert. S'mores, in fact. Each guest sits obediently as the staff spreads crushed graham cracker all around the dining room. The guests are adorned with marshmallow necklaces and hats made of chocolate. And once everything is plated perfectly, Chef Julian Slowick ignites the fire, serving his final creation. For such a simple film taking place largely in a single location, there are lots of different angles from which to approach it. It's a film about the creative process and the commodification of art. It's a film about the extremes of the service industry. It's a film about society's relationship to abusive would-be geniuses. And, of course, it's all about class. I opened this video talking about Glass Onion because it can be tempting to view the menu as a similar satire of wealth, one in which the 1% aren't as smart as they think and are so badly behaved that they deserve whatever tragedy befalls them. And while that's a perfectly valid lens through which to view it, I think the menu has a slightly more biting critique nestled within it. See, I can't get that final sequence out of my head, watching the staff slowly prepare dessert as the diners just sit there. Even earlier, not only did Tyler willingly come to the restaurant after being told he would die, but Slowick even says at one point, Why didn't you all try harder to fight back? Honestly, you probably could have. Something to think about. Why did Tyler come to the restaurant? Why did some of society's most rich and powerful people just sit there through indignity after insult after horror? See, I think the menu is less a critique of wealth or power and more a critique of prestige, which is both a byproduct of wealth and power, but also a resource the wealthy and powerful obsessively chase. Prestige is a powerful intoxicant, it is a social signal that tells us how to behave, and it is a lens we apply to the actions of strangers in order to understand them better. Wealth can buy loyalty, and power can compel it, but prestige, Prestige makes people throw their loyalty to you willingly. It makes them beg to be in your orbit. 
Look at someone like Elon Musk, a pampered, pompous princeling who came from wealth and used his privileges to buy his way into tech royalty, his only talents being the ability to separate marks from their money and to evade shame. At one time, he was the richest man in the world, buying his way into global influence and buying his way out of consequences for being a sexual predator. But with all that money and fame and power, Elon is still the most insecure man in the world, a man who needed to be loved, not obeyed. Elon bought Twitter seeking prestige, and much like Tyler in the menu, completely embarrassed himself. Perhaps his story might end the same way. What I see satirized in the menu has less to do with elites being out of touch, and more to do with how much we, all of us, let prestige endanger our lives. Tyler so idolizes Chef Slowick that he will walk to his death just for the chance to touch the hem of Julian's cloak. The kitchen staff are so devoted to Slowick that they barely show any hesitation at dying for his self-centered magnum opus. And not only does Hawthorne's prestige lull the guests into obedience in and of itself, each of those guests is at the restaurant hoping this prestige will rub off on them. It's not enough to be able to afford a $1,200 a plate dinner. The point is for others to admire your ability to do so. As I look at the world around me, particularly in the United States, I see a society dying in the stranglehold of prestige. And sure, the obvious example is to look at how we treat our politicians. Donald Trump became the new Republican Christ practically overnight, inspiring a legion of followers to believe any lie that tumbled out of his mouth, and ultimately inspired a fascist coup in our nation's capital, attempting to overturn the election results. The Democrats are no better, idolizing Barack Obama, the first Nobel Peace Prize winner to drone strike a fellow recipient. They also lionize corrupt creeps like Nancy Pelosi, chanting Yas Queen as she engages in insider trading and fights tirelessly to protect her corporate donors from you and your family's needs. Partisans on either side admire their team captains and obediently participate in politics when, where, and how they are told. Adjacent to that is the prestige enjoyed by the political class as a unit, as a system. Anytime someone talks approvingly of bipartisanship, or reaching across the aisle, or respecting the office, they are betraying their admiration for the power structure itself, going to bat for a system that easily accommodates fascists sitting in the same chamber right next to anti-racist community organizers and everyone else in between. Sure, it's unfortunate that the office will tolerate QAnon-affiliated extremists like Paul Gosar and Marjorie Taylor Greene, but we live in the greatest, freest country in the world, baby. Gotta respect it. Sure, the sous chef just flavor blasted the back of his skull all over the dining room, but it's all part of the show. Please stay seated. Think of how we speak about the police and the military, even in 2023, even amidst thousands of officers murdering unarmed civilians, even amidst the numerous war crimes committed against people in the Middle East and elsewhere, even amidst cover-up after cover-up after cover-up after cover-up, we still salute the flag, back the badge, and thank you for your service. State security forces still enjoy an incredible amount of prestige to this day. Cities willingly shovel the majority of their budgets into their police forces, and the United States military is the most well-funded on Earth, with the party of small government complaining that it's still not enough. Prestige is why we allow business mavericks to abuse their employees and visionary auteurs to harass the crew. Prestige is why we allow charismatic influencers to treat their audiences like a meat market. Prestige is why we stare at a machine grinding us to death and can only dream of maybe one day being in the control booth instead of on the conveyor belt. When I watch the final moments of the menu, I am horrified by the docility with which the dinner guests allow themselves to be prepared for the slaughter. Earlier, I proposed that it is the prestige of Slowick and the Hawthorne restaurant that cows the wealthy guests into obedience, but part of me suspects it's something even more terrifying. See, I began this essay describing the way Glass Onion makes a fool out of the wealthy elites and lampoons their willingness to be in 100% solidarity with each other in order to keep alive the illusion of a just world rewarding the best and brightest. In Glass Onion, their commitment to the bit is hilarious. But while the menu is often wickedly funny at times, it shows the inevitable and decidedly unfunny outcome of class solidarity among the wealthy. 
death by fire for everyone. Do you think capitalists don't know what their system of extraction and waste is doing to society and the planet? Do you think the people who study all the best ways to squeeze the pennies out of your savings accounts don't know what's coming? The petrochemical industry has known about impending climate catastrophe for decades. The UN is well aware that global food supplies are going to be obliterated by the soil-destroying consequences of profit-motivated agriculture in around 60 harvests. Many of us watching will still be alive then. Our children definitely will be. What horrifies me about the final moments of the menu is not thinking the guests have been emotionally broken into obedience. It's thinking that they are content with the prestigious seats they scored for the end of days. What scares me most is thinking that this is a glimpse into the mindset of the capitalist death cult running our lives, that their goal is no longer to live forever, but rather to die admired. They don't want to be saved as long as they're being served. If that's true, there is no cheeseburger ex machina that will unlock the doors and let us out of this system. If we want to live, we're going to have to spit on prestige, violate decorum, and cause a scene. We're going to have to ruin dinner for a lot of people.